Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Dark Souls 3, Soul Level 1, New Game Plus 7, No Damage Run. This is the Ringed City, and if you're new to this run, I will be no damaging the game between bonfire to bonfire, and I will be exempt from fall damage, poison damage, and we're pretty much doing all the bosses in the game that are worth fighting, so hopefully it's something for you all to enjoy. And I was really enjoying the vista here until I looked up at that mountain. For some reason there's a really shitty looking mountain that they didn't give much love to back there, which doesn't look very good. And once again, you're not really going to see the full impression of how good this area looks on my recording because of the uh, the resolution and the quality that I recorded in. It's not quite as high as what I was playing on. And that's something that I, I need to work on because this looks fucking stunning, this zone. And I said it on my uh, original blind playthrough, I think the, the idea of the Ring City and the visual aesthetic of it is wonderful. It just... The Soul series has this infatuation with focusing on things that I don't think are very good. Like, they've had this massive city, sprawling huge, cast from bronze, really impressive, and what do they focus on? Fucking swamps. Dirty, asshole, brown, filthy swamps that nobody likes. Like, I just don't understand it. It's, it's worth a video of itself, just to look into this mentality of they, they, they craft these beautiful cityscapes and then they never let us adventure in them, but instead we dive into the toilet bowl of pestilence, like why? Why is it always this way? I will never understand. But this is also a zone where I'm not going to be fighting too much because this very beginning with the Adjudicator Argo character and all the ruined sentinel phantoms, it's just not my cup of tea. You know, being English of course, tea is, is, is my modus operandi but not today as we move past that weird guy and we're going to be running past these other scrubbers that try and push us off these bootleg Henwick Lane dudes but we will fight a few of those and we're going to fight one of those ringed knights which is just a dark wraith who's apparently had an ascetic life for some reason and that's why he's wearing the nun headscarf which I don't understand why why are all dark wraiths nuns now it's very strange and incredibly violent too nuns are not supposed to be violent you assholes but Here's the first of these worshippers that I'm going to take on. The next bunch in here I'm not going to go near because look at that. That's a dude on a roof who's passively cursing me by just existing. And he'll do the same. The one who's running ahead right now for whatever reason. If I stay and fight him, I don't have enough curse resistance to stay and fight him. It's it's really annoying. But here is the first of the ringed knights. This dude killed me more times than Medea did. Which, I shouldn't be dying to Medea, but I was. Because I kept choking for some reason. And I get the worst Medea fight in the world so you look forward to that but this guy has an incredible array of swings he swings about four to five times when he gets going he's he's just like the dark wraiths in this game where they kind of designed them to just be assholes the thing with this dude that makes him really challenging is he does two swings that if you roll the first swing you will always get hit by the second and look at the little scrubber that just decides to turn up mid fight and start cursing me for no reason what an asshole where did he even come from but luckily enough, we managed to get the uh, the dude that mattered, and that was the end of that. But that was scary for about 30 seconds. And I, th I thought about attacking him, and then I decided not to. Quickly swap to the cat ring, so that I don't get killed on the fall damage coming up. And be careful of these stupid, Krillin teleporting turtle dudes. Not my idea of a fun enemy, but alas, here they are. Drop down, run forward, and... The gauntlet here is, is another example of, of ringed city design that I just don't accept. These enemies take a profound amount of damage, they have incredible hit radiuses, and there's this many of them? Why? Why are there so many of them? It makes no sense, and I appreciate you can do a really fancy plunge attack that looks awesome, but how the fuck does a plunge attack help you when you're trying to get past them? It doesn't. And they respawn too, quite a lot. So it's just one of those areas where it's like, could they have put more enemies in this area? I don't think they could have. Seems very strange to me. But we can hook around here, Hit the bonfire, and we're, we're going to get attacked by one of the locusts, because he's he's rather amorous as I'm in my menu, and I notice him, and there he is. Uh-oh. So, alas, time to fight, and look how much this guy takes with this weapon. This guy takes more hits than Gwyn does, which is hilarious, but I swapped to some extra damage to hopefully put him down. He does the jump attacks with that crazy weapon. The, well, I forget what it's called, it's like a worshipper arm or something. It's literally an arm of one of these dudes, one of these locusts. That's his grab. Be careful of that. And one more hit and he should be dead. So there you go. That was a lot of hits to kill an enemy. And what we're going to do now is we're going to run through the swamp on the left hand side. And we're going to go and kill the dragon slayer. 
because I like fighting cool enemies, and he's a really cool enemy. Everything else in this area can die in a fire, repeatedly, until the fire burns out, and then it's just ashes and everything that they once were. Like, that's how I feel about this entire zone. It's just... We went from a fantastic colour palette to amethyst and dog shit. Like, why? Such a strange thing. It's obviously because of Seath and, you know, because of Velka and because of all Father Lloyd and the Pendant and insert generic reason that everybody gives. Time is convoluted, so that's why everything's covered in black sludge. But it's obviously the corruption of the abyss, right, guys? You know, I just... Let us look round the ringed city instead of this toilet bowl, please. It looks so good. I'm tempted to try and find a way to hack so that I can get into that city area and explore it. Because this place should have been so much better than it is. But this guy killed me a few times, because why not? So I swap to the Irithyll sword, and I put on the Lothric war banner, and I do a quick buff, and we begin the fight. So if you've seen my Dragon Slayer fight, you'll kind of have an idea of what I'm going to do here. I'm going to bait his three hit combo, I'm going to run around it, I'm going to get three hits, I'm going to do whatever he does next, and then we're going to carry on. Here's his running shield slam, you can get about two to three hits from that. Go for two, usually. Anything more is a little bit greedy. That right there was dangerous, but we survived, so I'm okay with it. Here he goes with the shield bash. Depending on your proximity will depend on if he does a follow up to that, same with most of his moves. Sometimes it's proximity based, other times it seems to be like a hierarchy. There's the frame rate telling me that it's having problems for whatever reason. It randomly stutters. There's his swing. Notice how he's not following up any of the good moves, so I can't do many punishes. Instead, I seem to be punishing the shield bash a lot. So a nice two hits on the shield bash. That's what happens when you get three hits, but you have to be very careful because that could have killed me. So here's the one, two. Here's the third hit. Run to his ankle. Hit his ankle three times, or two times if you're being reserved like I am at the moment. This guy's got quite a lot of HP, so I can understand why I'm being a little bit more tentative with him. I do like this enemy, though. I like the boss as well, and this is the only opportunity in the game to fight this guy without butterflies, and it shows just how much... how fair this boss really is. He's very fair. In this particular area, he just seems to be kind of passive. Like, I, I've, I've managed to get really aggressive Dragon Slayer fights, and this is not one of them. This is kind of him just being defensive, not really knowing what's happening. I didn't opt to throw firebombs at him this time, I just decided to smack him a bit. Because once again, when you use a consumable, I'm almost certain it triggers a punish in the boss for him to do certain things. And because I was just fighting him, you know, mono a mono, like you do, as he does the streaking attack into the overhead, into the punish, which is two hits. And then he does the big shield slam, which you can also punish, but that time it recovered a lot quicker than the other one. So I'm glad I didn't. A couple of hits as he backs up. But I think he has a couple of programmed punishers for using certain things at distance, and I think it forces him to be aggressive. So there might be something to be said about, you know, intentionally pressing buttons that you don't want to get things to happen with to try and provoke a, an attack. I've been experimenting with this a little bit in Bloodborne. In Bloodborne, I've been farming a, a Watcher, and I've been testing something with the Watcher where uh, I've got a particular loop on him where I do a running attack, backdash, shoot my gun, and he always swings and it parries him again. I do a running attack, backdash, shoot my gun. And I can do that until I run out of stamina. And I think the reason that it works is I mash the uh, the attack button about three times before I do the gun. And I think the computer is reading the input and it's trying to punish it with the fastest move. I don't know 100% if that's the case, but uh, from tentative testing, it seems like he is more likely to do the right attack if I'm inputting a lot of attacks because they're designed in such a way that you know they try and beat you, they read your input, they try and beat it and we're exploiting that reading capability to get the result we want and it's this interesting idea of of manipulating the AI's manipulations and I'd love to know if it had any effect because I've tried it with both different ways and I've had varying results but it seems like when you do press it more than once, you get him to do the attack you want more often. But of course, all of this could be random. It could be just RNG and the merciful, fortuitous gods, but I don't know. I'm not too sure if you can data mine that kind of stuff. But we push forward now through the back end of the Ring City into an area that baffles me in so many ways. I have no idea why there is this many ringed knights in one spot. It just... I just, I question everything about this area, I really do. I'm going to have to analyse this zone, just just to, to get across everything about it that doesn't make sense to me. 
Like, I, I think this DLC could have been so much better if they'd not just bukkakied enemies everywhere. Like, there's a really nice eye for design in certain parts of it, and then other parts of it as if somebody fell asleep on the keyboard and accidentally inputted 9 million extra dudes. Like, it's very strange to me. But in this video is going to be probably the hardest part of the run so far, which was figuring out how to get past the bloody fire. So, normally, getting past Medea's fire is easy, because you can take a few hits, right? Well, on this run, I can't. So, I tried sprinting it a half dozen times, and it didn't work. So instead, I started trying to iframe the fire. And it turns out, the way that this works is, the sweep of flame is a one-hit kill, pretty much, but you can iframe it. And then afterwards, the lingering fire is completely random. So if you stand still afterwards and do not do anything until it fades, if you're not in fire, or even if you're in fire, but it's not technically right fire, you'll be okay. And right there, it just kind of encapsulates what I hated about Aldridge. Right then, I was stood on top of visual flames, and I wasn't taking any damage. I have no idea why that works that way, but it's the same thing with Aldridge, where sometimes there would be no flames there and I'd take fire damage, sometimes there'd be flames there and I'd be fine, and there didn't seem to be any kind of rhyme or reason to it, and it made that fight really awkward. The transition just then was me, of course, dying to the flame. So I, uh, I've cut it in there because this was the successful run. I had to bait him to attack an extra time, but you didn't miss anything important. Because let's face it, when you came to this run, were you really curious as to how I would navigate the fire bridge from Medea's Flame? You really weren't, were you? But these are the parts that turn out to be really difficult in these kind of runs. Because unless you've got a guaranteed strategy of getting through it, you, don't, you just have to make it up as you go along. And uh, we're going to be fighting Medea coming up here, and it takes about five minutes which is kind of hilarious, because my pattern for it is very safe, but it's consistent. And you can use this at any level, it'll help you get past him on the bridge. That's if you don't just sprint past him, because I know people probably skip Medea, because I, I appreciate the internet's not a big fan of him, which seems kind of strange to me, because Medea is... I think Medea is probably one of the strongest bosses in the game, because he's consistent. The only thing that gets me with Medea is the mix-ups with the pursuers. And that in itself is kind of rare too. I also occasionally get jacked up by his, uh, you know the combo that he does at the beginning of the fight? His moving flame breath claw swipe. Because I started initially running to the right to dodge it, and then I think I got punished once. And then I started running to the left to dodge it, and then I got punished once. And then I started rolling forward through it, and I got punished once. Yet each of those methods have survived several times doing it, so it's kind of this weird thing of, you've just got to kind of figure out the way that works for you, and uh, understand that the hitboxes can be a bit wonky. So the strategy for Medea. Stand in this little crevice, when you see Medea move his head back and relocate, he's gonna breathe fire on top of you. Run out of the crevice and attack him. Once you've finished attacking him, he's gonna breathe fire down the lane that we were on attacking him, and then he's gonna have to wait for him to do the, the one we want. So that's maximized damage there. Here he's gonna do fire to get us off him, and all we're gonna do is watch him breathe fire He's going to reset his animation, and the moment he moves, watch him, as the frame rate dies, boom, now we want to move. As long as he moves back like that, it means we're going to be able to hit his claws three times, and then we're going to R2 his head. And that's the best damage we can do. And he should either do big combo, flame breath, or get off my balls flame breath. He will never ever do the move where we're stood right here. Because right now, look, just normal breath. And you'll notice the fire's in front of me, but it's not hurting me. Watch his animation. Reset, move, boom. We go out, we hit his hand, we hit his jaw. And that's all you do. It just takes an eternity because he has a lot of life. That was not meant to be what that was. You know what this game is like, guys. Do I ever jump attack? Not really. And if I were to do a jump attack, I'd do it at the end of a sprint because it's easier to do it. Which leads me to a criticism of this game, which I think Bloodborne did considerably better. In Bloodborne, you can do running R2s. And the running R2s are almost nothing like the jump attacks. They do unique animations that do extra damage and give you a little bit more stun and put you in a little bit more recovery. Why doesn't this game have that? Like, almost every running attack when you do R2 in this game just does a jump attack. And I can appreciate it's like a shortcut to jump attack, but I liked having the choice to do different moves. That's wrong, by the way. That was the wrong breath. Did you see it? He didn't move backwards. He moved to his left. I, I saw it. I recovered and we were okay. That's what we want. We want him to move upwards like that. So just be aware that this is a loop that will work, but every so often he gets a bit fancy. And if you don't read it quick enough, you'll die. So be very careful. 
But that's the thing I think I like the most about Bloodborne and why it's my favourite combat wise. Because it gives you so many more options. For a game that only has a, a few weapons, even though all of them are pretty awesome I think. Like, they gave you movesets to make up for that. There's so many tools for so many situations. And in Dark Souls, especially Dark Souls 3, I never use the skills because half the time they're superfluous and too long and unnecessary. I barely use anything other than standard R1s and charged R2s. Like, there's two moves I do. Sometimes I do running attack, but it's rare. That's it, R1, R2. Whereas in Bloodborne, I use both transformation attacks. I use roll transformation attacks, I use sprinting transformation attacks, I do the R2s, I do running R2s, I do the combination between the two, like, I find myself having a tool for almost every situation, and you could probably do that in this game, and there's probably avenue for it, but I just don't find myself, oh they did it again, I don't see myself, you know, using the same kind of utility as I do in the moveset of that other game. And I, and I don't really know why, it might be the stamina too. In Bloodborne, your stamina goes down so slowly, you can use a lot of attacks and you can get creative. In this game, your stamina is, is a limited resource and you can try your best with regen and everything, but you're still limited to certain amounts of things. And when you do an attack that takes you into negative stamina, you have that wonderful penalty where there's a delay on its regen, which kills a lot of players until you're used to it for obvious reasons. And then you'll get to a point where you generally don't do that. But have you ever noticed, after doing like a barrage of attacks, when you've been moving away from the boss and you've gone to dodge and it's not dodged, that probably means that you were in that negative equity and that's why it didn't happen. And it's it's one of those things that, it happens in Bloodborne, definitely. But you don't notice it as much in Bloodborne just because of how much stamina you're afforded, because that game is faster. It's meant to be faster, it's meant to be played faster. And uh, it says a lot about it. And I'm excited to do something with Bloodborne because... This, this run has really put me in the, the mood to, to do some cool soul stuff. And hopefully it goes well on the channel. You know, if you enjoy this, guys, and you want to see something else, you know, who knows, we might be able to do something fun with one of the other titles. But we're on the way to Medea now. This is a run back that you're going to know off by heart if you've died a few times to him. And we're going to drop into the mouth of his cavern, and then that's going to be the video, and the next fight will be Medea. The fight itself is about 10 minutes long, because I end up getting a shitty pattern. I say a shitty pattern, it's not really a shitty pattern, it's shitty play on my part. I fuck up the repost, so I have to fight him legitimate for the end of the fight, which is not what I want ever. But thank you for watching, and I will see you in the Dark Eater video. You take care now.